The Lord be with you. My name is Pastor Jennifer, and it's my joy to welcome you to our first worship service here in 2024. Um, if you are new, I want to extend an especially warm welcome to our guests and our visitors. If you would like to connect with us more deeply in your pew backs, you'll find a, a card you can fill out, drop in one of our offering boxes, either in the front, up here, or back in the welcome area, and that's a great way to connect with me. Also, if you would like to give, you can do that in the boxes or online. This Wednesday night, we get back in the swing of things. So our potluck is going to resume. We're going to have four different small group options. Two of them are book-based, and two of them are video-based, and so you kind of pick your level. Um, and so for the book-based ones, we do ask you go ahead and order your book, read the introduction in chapter one, and come prepared to discuss. You can find all of those details in your bulletin. Also coming up is on Friday, January 19th, we will be hosting a short film documentary um, screening. So that'll be new for us, but we're really excited about it. It's a local musician, Drew Young, um, in his movie, From Dust We Came. And so it's just a 16-minute short film, and then the filmmaker and Drew will both be here to answer questions and talk about themes of forgiveness and family. And so we hope you'll join us for that. There is free child care, so if you want to make a date night of it, um, you're welcome to do that as well. Doors open at 7 o'clock. And then, please save the date for our all-church council meeting, which is going to be Saturday, January 20th, from 9 to noon. So if you're sitting there thinking, do I need to be there? The answer is, if you are a committee chair, yes, you need to be there. Any team, any committee, if you are the chair. If you can't be there, please appoint somebody else. We have one meeting like this a year, okay? And so please do your best to come. We'll, we'll calendar plan, we'll dream, we'll also review budgeting and how we do that here at UBC. And so we're gonna cram it all in in those three hours and then hopefully that'll be it for 2024. So if you can join us, um, please make that a priority. And I do want to acknowledge this morning, we had a wonderful workshop from the Bad British Joint Committee for Religious Liberty. General Counsel Holly Holman has been with us. And so if you want more information about that, um, this week in our E! News Wednesday update, I'll be sending links to their podcast, to the Christians Against Christian Nationalism letter you can sign, and also to their website. So if you want to um, connect more deeply there and miss that opportunity this morning, all of that information will be in the E! News. With all of that said, let's take a moment to center ourselves on the presence of Christ here among us this morning.
Will you please join in a responsive reading of the call to worship? O come, let us worship the Lord and consider what wondrous things God has done. The Magi who study the heavens follow a guiding star. O come, let us worship the Lord and consider what wondrous things God has done. The prophets who live in the shadows see a glorious light. O come, let us worship the Lord and consider what wondrous things God has done. The Christ who unveils the hidden plan, making us joint heirs of the promise of salvation through the gospel. O come, let us worship the Lord, for God has done wondrous things. Please stand and join us in singing hymn number 151, We Three Kings. Let us pray. 
Father, we pray that just as the Magi sought your star, we will continue to seek you. Although you promise to be with us always, we sometimes forget that. Lead us by faith to your presence, now and in each day of our lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If you would like to follow this reading in your pew Bible, you will find it on page 1335. Our New Testament lesson is from the third chapter of Paul's letter to the Ephesians, verses 1 through 12. This is the reason that I, Paul, am a prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. For surely you have already heard of the commission of God's grace that was given to me for you and how the mystery was made known to me by revelation. As I wrote above in a few words, a reading of which will enable you to perceive my understanding of the mystery of Christ. In former generations, this mystery was not made known to humankind. As it is now revealed, to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That is, the Gentiles have become fellow heirs, members of the same body, and sharers in the promise in Jesus Christ through the gospel. Of this gospel, I have become a servant according to the gift of God's grace that was given to me by the working of his power. Although I am the very least of the saints, this grace was given to me to bring to the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ and to make everyone see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for the ages in God who created all things so that through the church, the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose that he has carried out in Jesus Christ our Lord, in whom we have access to God in boldness and confidence through faith in him. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God.
Here at University Baptist Church, it is our practice to take communion on the first Sunday of the month. So if you're joining us online, I'll invite you to grab some juice and crackers and follow along with us this morning. Here at UBC, we practice what's called an open table, meaning if you are here and present, you are welcome to participate because this table does not belong to any one pastor or priest, any one church or denomination, but it is Christ Jesus, and he bids you a warm welcome. Join me now in our communion litany found in your bulletin this morning. Here at this table and in this sanctuary, let the divine spark enter our lives. Let the holy light aid us in seeing the Christ in our midst. The brightness of Jesus the Christ will illuminate our way. The radiance of the Christ will warm our hearts. God is shining upon you, and God's light streams upon you. Open your hearts. We open them to the brilliance of God. Let us give thanks for the light and love of God. We praise our Creator with joy and thanksgiving. It is indeed right to give you our thanks and praise, O God, for your mercy and justice are a light in our darkness, and your word outlasts even heaven and earth which you have created. Before the ages, your wisdom destined us for glory, and you have revealed your depths to us through the Spirit. When we failed in righteousness and turned our worship into a mask, hiding our oppression, contempt, and disregard of others, you rejected our fasts and prayers and sent prophets to denounce our rebellion and call us back to your ways. In your child Jesus and him crucified, we have seen the light of the world and found a spring of healing that never fails. You raised him from the dead and through him gave us your spirit, who has begun the rebuild rebuilding of our integrity on the ancient foundations of justice, mercy, and compassion. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with the choirs of heaven and with all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Remembering all your mighty and merciful acts, we take this bread and this wine from the gifts you have given us and celebrate with joy the redemption won for us in Jesus Christ. Accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, as a living and holy offering of ourselves, that our lives may proclaim the one crucified and risen. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. May the same spirit that lifted Christ from the grave be poured out on these gifts. Make the spread and this cup be an extension of God's welcome that knows no bounds. Fill us with the courage to join you in the work of tearing down walls that exclude, the boldness to point to the sacred and the margins, and the vulnerability to let our light shine before all people. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he gathered with his friends in the upper room, and he took bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, saying, this is my body, broken for you. And then he took the cup, and pouring out the wine, he said, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sins for many. Drink this in remembrance of me.
guys for me. Join me now as we say the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> to the Lord in prayer, I want to share an update that a Bryant Myatt passed away last night, and so please be in prayer with Peggy. We will share information um, later this week regarding a service and visitation, um, but just keep that family in your prayers. Join me now as we go before God. God of illumination, we give you thanks for the gift of another year a gift of a new opportunities on our horizon. We thank you for how you have loved us and led us in the past year and ask that you would open our hearts anew to what you are up to. We pray today, God, for our world that is hurting. We pray your continued presence in Ukraine and in Gaza and we pray that you would be with our world leaders and our diplomats and all of those who are seeking to make peace in impossible situations. We continue to pray for our country, Lord, as we enter with both fear and trepidation another election year. We pray that you would make us wise as we face decisions. 
We pray your continued blessings on the Baptist Joint Committee and their work in our world. Help us know where we can join and support them. We pray that the light of Christ would be found in us and that we would shine that light to one another in our community. We pray especially for Peggy this morning. We celebrate her six decades of marriage to Bryant and ask that we would be a good and faithful community in the days ahead to her. We ask that you continue to show us the next step on this new path. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Our second scripture reading this morning comes from the Old Testament. It comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 60, verses 1 through 6. And I'll be reading from the Robert Alter translation this morning, but you are welcome to follow along in your pew Bible on page 679 and 680. Rise, O shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has dawned over you. For, look, darkness covers the earth, and thick mist the peoples. But nations shall walk by your light, and kings by your dawning radiance. Raise your eyes all round and see. They have all gathered, come to you. Your sons shall come from afar, and your daughters um, dang, dang, dangled on the hip. Then shall you see and gleam, and your heart shall throb and swell, for the sea's bounty shall be yours, and the wealth of nations shall come to you. A tide of camels shall cover you, dromedaries from Midian and Ephaph. They shall all come from Sheba. Gold and frankincense they shall bear, and the Lord's praise they shall proclaim." For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. This is the first Sunday of Epiphany. It is the season of light. And last year, I'm sure you all remembered my Epiphany sermon, where I talked about that Epiphany means to make manifest or to make conspicuous the light of the world. Christ has been born, Christmas has happened, whether you were ready or not, and now we enter a season of the light of Christ growing in the world, and so for the next several weeks, we'll be exploring what this light of Christ means and how we are to live by it. But first, we need to explore this concept, this idea of what does it mean to have this light, and I think it's important to go back to Isaiah, where this connection begins. And this whole chapter, actually chapter 60 and 61 and 62, are all optimistic. They are full of this vision of dawning light. And so the first question that comes to us in Epiphany is what do we have to do to obtain this light? How, how do we get this light of Christ? And it's really striking to me that in chapter 60, there's no call for repentance. There, there's no promise of if you do this, then you obtain salvation. There's not even a condemnation for previous wrongs. Instead, the only imperative, the only action you and I have to take in order to receive this light is the very first word, arise, arise. That's all we have to do is to get up, it seems too simple. It seems like a trick. And also, I'll confess that I am not a morning person, right? So arising to me seems a little more difficult. John Mark will vouch for this. I'm a morning person in two specific situations. Christmas morning and when I'm at the beach. There's something about the beach that enables me to wake up earlier than I ever would without an alarm. And my favorite thing about the beach is a sunrise. I love waking when it's still dark, and I can just hear the waves, even if I can't see them at that point. And one of my favorite things about sunrise at the beach is it somehow sneaks up on you. Like you're awake for it the whole time, and the sky is so, so dark. And then all of a sudden, it's this deep navy, 
and then it's going into this lighter blue. And then you blink, and suddenly pinks and oranges are breaking through. And slowly you see the sun rise over the ocean. And it'll just take your breath away. And that's what I love about Robert Alter's translation of the, the text here. It says, the glory of the Lord has dawned upon you. Have you ever thought about God's glory dawning like a sunrise? So slow at first, you don't even notice that it's happening, and suddenly you are in the midst of it. Often in our culture, we assume that disasters happen suddenly, whether they're natural disasters like hurricanes being this close to the Gulf, or unexpected phone calls or, or tragedy. But our text this morning promises that disasters may happen, but so can goodness. Goodness can break upon us just as suddenly as a new dawn. And all we have to do is arise to see it, to open our eyes, to be aware of it happening. Somebody else calls chapter 60 a wake-up call to the nation of Israel. And, and why did Israel need a wake-up call? Well, things hadn't gone well. They had gone through an intense period of suffering, of being dislocated from their land, of constant conquerings by foreign powers. And so this optimistic chapter is not naive about what is happening. This optimism is proclaimed in the midst of deep darkness. Verse 2 tells us, for look, darkness covers the earth and thick mist the peoples. And if we are going to define light, we also have to define what did we mean by darkness. We don't just mean nighttime or even the color. We mean the presence of something unnatural, something evil, something different. And so we can think about light as the presence of Yahweh and then darkness simply as the absence of that presence. And so as I look around in our world, all you have to do is open Instagram or turn on the cable news or listen to what we pray about in our, in our churches right now to know that we are a people surrounded by deep darkness, by wars and rumors of wars, by yet another week of school shooting by the fact that Alzheimer's and dementia continue to be diseases that we don't have cures for. Whatever it is, we know that deep darkness surrounds us. And it's in the midst of this that this prophet offers this word, this vision, this prophetic hope of saying, listen, I know all around what it looks like but I promise something different is coming. Rise, O oh shine, for your light has come. The prophet is trying to wake up the people to the fact that God is in breaking in the world. If we read past where the scripture was assigned, which I'm always a fan of, more scripture, and got down to verse 11, the promises continue. And it says, and they shall open your gates perpetually, night and day they shall not close, to buy you the wealth of nations and their kings as captives driven. What does this mean to have gates open perpetually? I think about my family growing up in a, in a small town and the fact that it was not until I was probably eight or nine that I realized people were supposed to lock their vehicles. You see, nobody did that out in the country. We just left the keys in there. And so whenever somebody needed to go get a vehicle, you just knew that the, the, the keys were in the truck, they were in the vehicle, they were in the tractor. Nobody was worried about you running off with anything. And so when the prophet here promises that the gates will be open night and day because 
the goodness, the light of Yahweh has illuminated the world. It's made it safe again. There's nothing to fear. There's an openness here. People can come and go. It echoes the imagery that's found in Revelation, which I know we don't get to a lot in our church. But in Revelation, the lamb is seated upon the throne and the gates to the kingdom of God are opened continually. God is always saying, welcome. And so we are, we are promised that in this light, that the world will be anew, it will be different. And we can think about the light being Yahweh, and I can think about Yahweh being like the sun. And if God is the sun, then we, God's church, are perhaps called to be the moon. The moon, which does not have light of its own, but powerfully reflects the light of the sun. And so we are called to be that kind of light in the world on this epiphany Sunday. You might have caught that it is traditional to talk about the Magi. We sang all five verses of We Three Kings this morning, and we did it on purpose. And so on the altar here, you'll find the three Magi. Traditionally, we know that they showed up after the birth of Christ. They were late. It took them a while to figure out their star charts and maps They took a detour to Jerusalem and got tied up with King Herod, and they were about nine miles off their mark, but they kept going step by step by intentional step, and they did not know where they were going to end up. They were just following this light. They knew they had to take this journey. They weren't sure what was going to be at the end of it. And these foreigners, these outsiders to the promise, end up discovering the Christ child. And so these magi in our tradition have have always appeared at the end of our Christmas season. And we've defaulted to calling them kings. And I have a newsflash. They're not kings. I had this argument when I was five and our children's choir was singing We Three Kings. This is my first memory of the song. And three of the boys in my choir got to wear crowns And they took the second, third, and fourth verses, singing all the different gifts they were bringing. And I was beside myself because I wanted to wear the crown. I wanted to have the jewelry. And I huffily told my choir director that there was no way that all of these magi were men. (laughs) And my choir director blamed my mom. And my mom said, I can't take credit. She is who she is. And so (laughs) I stood at my Christmas choir program and refused to sing in silent protest of of the Magi being all men. And so, no, we don't actually know if they were all men, technically. And the closest we can get in the translation to Magi is just kind of magicians or mysterious. But we know that they were highly educated and that they were open to signs a different way of seeing, and they were willing to risk this journey. And we don't know if there were three, but we do know that they brought three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And traditionally, if you've been around church for a long time, there there are these assignments to each of these gifts. Gold for a king, frankincense would have been a priestly gift, symbolizing that Jesus was going to be our high priest, and then myrrh as a burial ointment, foreshadowing the fact that Jesus was going to die. And to be honest, I've always thought these were kind of dumb gifts. I don't know if you're familiar with the five love languages. By raise of hand, who's familiar with the five love languages? Okay. So the premise is that there are five unique ways that people give and receive love. And so there's like quality time, There's acts of service, there's words of affirmation, there's, help me out here, physical touch, and gifts, gift giving. And for a long time, I thought gift giving was like the most shallow one, okay? I was like, who would express their love that way? But coming off a season where we give and receive gifts, I can acknowledge that there's some real value 
and gift giving. When you are known and seen by somebody, it's a wonderful thing to get a gift from them that says they've been paying attention to you. They know your likes and your dislikes. They know what brand of thing that you use. They know what you would enjoy. Gift giving has become incredibly powerful to me because it's a way that someone pays attention to you. And so when I look at the Magi and I look at their gifts, I think, I don't, I don't know about these gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. But something changes for me when I think about the gifts in a different light. You see, I don't think these gifts were actually for Jesus. I think they were actually for Mary. The gold financed their flight to Egypt. Frankincense was known for its calming properties, perhaps akin to giving a new mom essential lavender oils to burn in her home in hopes that calm would happen. And myrrh has often been overlooked by, I would say, male Bible scholars, and the role that it plays in postpartum healing. A traditional midwife would have prescribed myrrh. And so when I think about these gifts then that the Magi have brought for the mother, it makes more sense to me that these are practical, that they are grounded, that they are meant to help this holy family heal and be safe in the world. This 2024 New Year is upon us, and each one of us have gifts to offer the world, whether we know it or not. And so this year, again, I want to mark this year by the giving of stars that have a word for you. And at the end of the service, there'll be a basket up on the altar, and there'll be a basket as you exit. And you can't pick your word. You just have to reach in. There's no cheating here. But I hope that you'll pull it out and you'll ponder it, and you'll think about how and who could benefit from the gift. Maybe it's a word you need. Maybe it's a word you need to pay attention to in the world. Maybe it's something you've got to offer someone else. But as we begin in our season of light, the most profound and radical thing we can do is twofold. One, recognize that dawn has broken over us. And the second is to offer the light of dawn to people that we encounter. As I close out this morning, this sermon, I want to read a poem by Anne Waynes, who in her book, Kneeling to Bethlehem, has a story about, well, if it is up here, maybe not. I'll have to pull it up on my phone. <laughs> Give me a second. Thankful for a backup plan. So here now, this poem. What I'd really like to give you for Christmas is a star. Brilliance and a package, something you could keep in the pocket of your jeans or in the pocket of your being, something to take out in times of darkness, something that would never snuff out or tarnish, something you could hold in your hand, something for wonderment, something for pondering, something that would remind you of what Christmas has always meant, God's advent light into the darkness of this world, but stars are only for God's giving, and I must be content to give you words and wishes and packages without stars. But I can wish you a life as radiant as the star that announces the Christ child's coming, and as filled with awe as the shepherds who stood beneath its light. And I can pass on to you the love that has been given to me, ignited countless times by others who have knelt in Bethlehem's light. Perhaps 
if you ask, God will give you a star. Amen. As we enter into a time of response, I'll invite you to offer your prayers and praises to God. This is also an opportunity if you would like to make UBC your church home or become a Christ follower, you are welcome to do so. Let's join and stand in singing our invitation hymn, hymn number 156, <coughs> Shine, Jesus, Shine.
receive an open-eyed benediction. May the God of illumination cause your radiance to light each step and be an inspiration to each face you encounter. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.